Namaste, good evening. On behalf of Central Zoo Authority and Sri Chamarendra Zoological Garden, I extend a warm welcome to all our listener participants who have joined us today from across the globe. This is a third in series of the webinars that we have initiated to reach out to the zoo community on topics that are of mutual interest and also to bring to you global experts who are well known and respected in this field. Today, through this digital platform, we bring to you some very esteemed speakers to discuss and dwell upon the aspects of biobanking, cutting edge science to reduce extinction risk. At the onset, I would like to welcome Dr. S.P. Yadav, ADG Project Tiger and Member Secretary, National Tiger Conservation Authority and Central Zoo Authority. A keen forester and wildlife owner, Dr. Yadav has been instrumental in steering tiger conservation in its range countries and is always supportive to out-of-box approaches and capacity building initiatives to strengthen ex situ in situ linkages. Over to you now, sir, for your opening remarks. So we cannot hear you, sir. Am I audible now? Yes, you are. Yes. Am I? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay, thank you, Sonali, uh, and good evening to you all. And um, on the behalf of CJD, I warmly welcome Dr. Ryder and Dr. Karthikeyan, and uh, wish that uh, this webinar will be exciting to all participants. Dr. Ryder, very good morning to you because it must be early over there. And thank you. Dr. Dr. Ryder, if you recall, I was privileged to attend a session on biobanking in the last WAZA conference at Buenos Aires. So that was really nice and quite insightful, quite informative. So basically the Central Zoo Authority of India uh, is a statutory body and uh, works under the Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change. And this is a statutory in the sense that its existence has come because of the Wildlife Protection Act. Unlike other countries, the CJD has power to regulate the establishment of zoo. No zoo can be created or can run, can operate without the recognition by the CJD, by getting recognition from the Central Zoo Authority. So in that way, we are we uh, do regulatory function, but gradually we are converting into graduating into facilitating role. We also provide technical assistance and financial support to Indian zoos. And you, you, as you may be aware that there are 152 recognized zoos in the country. And uh, Dr. Ryder, you will be surprised to know that there are more than 70 million people they visit our zoos on an annual basis. Zoos are very good centers for education and awareness, especially for the kids and the aged people, because they cannot uh, our national parks, sanctuaries, and tiger reserves. Next slide, please. Why this uh, biobanking is important? I think everyone understands. I recall a few months back, uh, U uh, United Nations IPCC report that was alarming, kind of. It said that 1 million floral and faunal species, they are under threat of extinction. And the rate of extinction is much faster than what we have experienced earlier. So definitely the situation is very grim. If you take example of India, we lost our cheetahs in 1947. Last cheetah was sighted in 1947. And after that, it's more than 70 years, we have not been able to bring back cheetah into our wild. Similarly, if you see the example of Tasmanian tiger of Australia, lost forever. It, it, it is obvious that once we lose the species, we lose it almost forever. There are a number of species in India which are at the world of extinction, like broentilid deer, the great Indian bustard, that bird, hardly 150 specimens are in the wild. Similarly, Kashmiri said there are a number of species. So the role of Central Zoo Authority is to support uh, 
in situ conservation by uh, doing conservation works in captivity. So I believe that uh, this collection of genetic material from dead specimens is the most uh, easiest thing, which easiest thing which can be done to collect the genetic material from the animal, uh, wild animals from our zoos. We have uh, lacons. I think the details will be um, told by Dr. Kartikeyan. He represents lacons, and they are doing a wonderful job. So CZD has prioritized number of species depending upon their status of end. end Next slide, please. I believe there is lack of biobanking. There is lack of capacity and lack of knowledge about the data management, like what to do after that. I also believe that uh, for biobanking, a regional and global network is very, very much important. And knowledge sharing, above all, is definitely very important for all of us. And for that purpose, this webinar has been organized. Uh, Dr. Ryder, I feel that down the line, 20 to 25 years, we will not be exchanging animals, but we will be exchanging genetic material. And maybe we recreate the animals. And that is, uh, I think that time will come, which is, which will, with this available technology, it will enable that. So we need to create a consortium of zoos to participate in the advances of biobanking for wildlife genetic resources. Uh, definitely this, this technology, this facility that this needs funding resources, infrastructure resources by the government and creation of capacity that is also very, very much important. And I think with this uh, webinar, our zoo participating zoo directors, they will understand the importance of biobanking and we will march ahead in this direction because I see a great future in biobanking and cryopreservation in, uh, in supporting in situ conservation in the country and the world. Thank you very much. I'm, um, uh, uh, I'm excited to, to hear Dr. Kartikeyan and uh, Dr. Ryder. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. You have set the tone for the webinar today. So now I would like to welcome Dr. Oliver Ryder, Director of Conservation Genetics for San Diego Zoo Global and adjunct professor in the Department of Evolution, Behavior and Ecology in the Division of Biology at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Ryder directs a laboratory group that includes activities in the area of molecular genetics, cytogenetics, cell culture, tissue culture, and stem cell studies. He has been involved with San Diego Zoo's Frozen Zoo project for over 35 years and this uh, unique resource of cell cultures has contributed to genetic rescue of several critically endangered species, uh, including notable scientific contributions to advancement in technology. Over to you now, sir, as uh, this must be very early morning for you. So thank you again for joining. Thank you. I'll share my screen when I can and I uh, very I'm honored to be invited to participate uh, in this important discussion. Um, uh, um, I will share my screen. And we can get started. So I uh, very much appreciate the uh, the invitation and the comments from uh, Dr. Yadav. Uh, this is, I agree very much, this is a very important topic and it's one of global importance and it's one that benefits both the current efforts that we are taking now and will have a significant impact in the future. We. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who are listed here. Um, I'm privileged to uh, speak uh, uh, on their behalf. And uh, we have uh, a, uh, a modest effort in uh, uh, 
tissue culture and uh, cytogenetics and cryobanking for and also gamete preservation um, at the San Diego Zoo. And the San Diego Zoo operates uh, two facilities. Um, I'll say three here. Uh, they operate the San Diego Zoo. They operate uh, the San Diego Safari Park, which is 80 kilometers north of San Diego. And San Diego is in the very southwest corner of the uh, United States. We are uh, 75 kilometers from the international border with Mexico. This research facility is uh, called the Beckman Center for Conservation Research, and it's where the home of the frozen zoo is, uh, whose picture I just showed you in the previous slide. Um, the frozen zoo was started in 1975 by the founding research director uh, for the San Diego Zoo, a physician named Kurt Benirschke. Um, he, uh, uh, in 1986, he, uh, I, I had the privilege to uh, take over that work uh, on the frozen zoo and was aided uh, initially by Arlene Kumamoto. And now the frozen zoo is curated by Marlis Hauk, who's become an international uh, expert, recognized expert on, on the banking of cells. Um, the frozen zoo has contributed enormously to um, a, a variety of studies. So as it was initiated, we didn't really appreciate all of its potential uses, although we did recognize that it was going to be, provide a resource that would enable uh, uh, studies and applications that we couldn't imagine at the time. But key papers and significant contributions in the area of, of, uh, of uh, in these areas that are listed here, in phylogeny, in systematics, and in species definition, and in the, event, the very exciting, expanding area of genetics in the last five decades. Um, and this information, uh, the having these, these materials ranked has allowed significant studies that have contributed to population management. And now with recent uh, uh, events, recent discoveries, um, it is uh, possible to uh, use these frozen cells for gene flow into living populations. And for the first time in the history of life on Earth, it's possible to uh, have living genetic material from an animal that's died or a species that's gone extinct. This provides, if its potential can be realized, an extraordinary new paradigm for the conservation of biological diversity. We don't have all the technology to apply all of, uh, to do all of this right now. We do have it for some species, it's actually possible. So there's a proof of principle. But the, uh, but uh, in the future, if the, as technologies develop and as we would anticipate that it would be possible to undertake uh, more and more cellular uh, interventions in uh, to um, preserve species using cryobank material, the key feature will be, did anybody bank the material? And there's never more going to be more biodiversity than there is now, at least not for millions of years. So we are at a very critical point in time where te technology is being uh, enabled where biodiversity is in, is declining, but that we can be agents of transferring the potential for an unprecedented level of species conservation to the future. And just to keep things current, um, these material, th these uh, frozen zoo materials are, are providing an extraordinary and powerful and sought after resource for expanding our knowledge of comparative genomics and uh, biodiversity genomics and genomics that are applied to the current pandemic to understand the evolution of uh, the receptors and uh, viruses that are causing the current, uh, that are contributing to the current pandemic. 
I uh, I would uh, say too that having living cells allows you to expand your knowledge of of chromosomes. You can only visualize chromosomes in dividing cells, and so uh, we uh, in our process of accumulating samples just randomly, we received a sample from a tiger uh, in a zoo in the United States, and it turned out it has a chromosomal error. This chromosomal error is similar to a human syndrome called Klinefelter syndrome that leads to sterility. And in fact, this male had been uh, fruit, fruitless in efforts to reproduce for a number of years. And then we knew why and uh, steps could be taken. But there are uh, very, this is just a quick example of some of the health interventions that uh, can come from having these cells. We found a gorilla that was growth retarded. And when we studied his chromosomes, we found out he had a big deletion um, in his third chromosome. So this individual um, has, you know, is excluded from the breeding population because of this genetic error. And it helps us in understanding and managing the uh, life in captivity of, of this uh, particular uh, male. The frozen zoo has accumulated samples um, I said since 1975, and it's been a steady and ongoing enterprise. Um, year by year, more uh, species are added, more individuals are added, so that we've accumulated um, a large uh, bank. So when people are starting out, um, uh, it's important to remember that the history of this kind of enterprise is very much making a modest start and building it up, but it's important to get started. My colleague, Dr. Barbara Durant, um, uh, is uh, banks uh, reproductive cells, um, uh, ova, spermatozoa, and reproductive tissues. Um, so the frozen zoo includes both these resources. I'm going to talk mostly about the cell, the fibroblasts, the uh, cellular resources that can we can divide and expand. But just quickly to go over what the collection looks like now. In cryobank sperm, um, there are over 400 species and probably about 2,000 individuals now, since this is an older slide. And there is the breakdown of their of their taxonomic uh, uh, classification. Most of them are mammals. The same thing is true for the uh, fibroblast collection, the skin cell collection of the frozen zoo. It's mostly mammals, and of the mammals, it's mostly primates, perissodactyls, artiodactyls, and carnivores. The, um, but the fastest growing portion of the frozen zoo is uh, birds. In the last uh, few years, more uh, new bird species have been added to the frozen zoo than mammal species. As a result of our work over the years, we've now accumulated uh, many, many mammal species. <clears throat> so this slide is a bit old, but here's a, a general breakdown of, of the numbers. Um, and it's got very broad representation um, across uh, uh, um, uh, terrestrial vertebrates. And as I said earlier, this has facilitated a large number of studies. I think that the scientific community is largely unaware of the, of the crucial or very important role that collections like this that come from zoos um, have contributed to the basic understanding and basic of, of biology and basic scientific knowledge. Uh, we uh, started a, a program uh, to try to uh, save cell cultures from endangered amphibians. It's estimated, if I remember correctly, approximately one third of amphibian species are in the threatened uh, classifications and threatened, endangered, critically endangered. Many of them are threatened by diseases, uh, uh, chytrid uh, fungus or, or viral diseases, and when we want to manage and learn how to, when we want to learn how to manage and treat and prevent diseases, um, we often rely on in vitro systems to study this so that the studies don't have to take place in live animals. And this is especially crucial for endangered species. 
but there was a there was and still is an, a significant uh, underrepresentation of these uh, critically endangered species in in cell banks and in in the ability actually to even culture their cells. So we've had to undertake really very basic studies to learn how to culture amphibian cells. And while we're very proud that we probably have the largest collection in the world of now of of uh, of, a di of diversity in amphibian cell cultures, um, it still fails in our hands most of the time. And we need to do basic research to learn why. So just to kind of summarize or reiterate, there are many important reasons for banking living cells. They're expandable. If you freeze them at early passage, you have them in, in, in uh, stored for millennia. They can be taken out and additional cells can be grown. You can freeze back and add back to the bank more cells than you took out. It's not an infinitely expandable resource because these kinds of cells senesce in culture, but you can manage this and curate this to be able to uh, produce a very large amount of material that can be kept um, for the long-term future. And we should be thinking about this, not just in, in, in years or decades, but on, on a very much larger time scale uh, about how the future can benefit from having this kind of material. This kind of living cells is, a, is an exquisite source of DNA from any organism, but from many small organisms, um, it's uh, uh, it, it, using current technology, it's the best and perhaps only way to obtain sufficient amounts of DNA for certain studies. And this includes enabling the highest quality uh, genome assemblies. This work in comparative genomics and in conservation genomics is adding enormously to the field uh, of uh, linking ex situ and in situ conservation. <coughs> Excuse me. And the uh, having uh, cellular material has made the frozen zoo a preferred uh, resource for some of the cutting edge uh, con uh, comparative genomic studies um, uh, that are taking place now, uh, including, well, I'll mention that in a minute. And with cells, you can do tests, as I said, in vitro that don't require the use of animals. This is very important for understanding basic biology and how, how cells work and how organisms work and how diseases progress. And remarkably, these cells can be used to uh, produce induced pluripotent stem cells, cells that can make any cell in the body. And that means that, uh, that the potential for uh, banking these skin cells uh, is to actually produce uh, animals, either through stem cell technology or through somatic cell nuclear transfer cloning. Um, this has been done um, in model species, and if this could be done across uh, the species that are uh, threatened and endangered, and um, it would, as I said earlier, uh, dramatically uh, insert a new paradigm into conservation. And when you work with cells, you obviate the necessity to handle animals, so it reduces animal welfare concerns, and I think unequivocally banking cells serves the interests of the future. So the uh, this field of genomics now, uh, over a decade ago, a project to sequence 10,000 vertebrates, which was audacious at the time, called Genome 10K, uh, began. It's now morphed into a project called the Vertebrate Genomes Project, which really aims to sequence the genomes of all vertebrate species. The technologies have improved, the costs have decreased, there are global centers, there are now DNA sequencing instruments that can be taken into the field and run off laptops. Um, this is a very rapidly and excitingly uh, developing area of biology that has direct relevance to conservation of biological diversity by, by assessing and monitoring uh, biodiversity, characterizing it and um, using that information to manage uh, uh, gene pools for long-term sustainability. 
in Nature uh, later this year will appear a paper uh, about the 200 Mammals Project that was a collaborative study with many institutions, but led out of the Broad Institute by Eleanor Carlson. And it's um, <coughs> produced some remarkable findings, both that are relevant to human medicine and to um, uh, endangered species conservation. I don't have time to go into all of this, but for those of you interested in promoting um, or evaluating the importance of, of, uh, of biobanking and cryobanking cells, uh, this paper will be very useful uh, for you to cite. So the one of the uh, real potential applications is for what we can call genetic rescue. Genetic rescue is a proven method for uh, reviving species that are, uh, have become pop or populations that have become fragmented and are declining um, by uh, infusing new genetic variation um, into these <clears throat> uh, dwindling populations. Um, notable examples include a, a large cat in, uh, in North America called the Florida panther, um, which animals were used to from an adjacent population, although they were considered a different subspecies. And a transient gene flow into the Florida panther population led to its invigoration and the reduction of the problems associated with inbreeding. And this has now been uh, noted in avian and other mammalian species. And um, so uh, we know that it works by transferring uh, animals. And this could in the future potentially be accomplished by using advanced cellular and uh, reproductive technologies. And the inset there is a picture of a cloned Javan Bantang that came from cells that had been stored in the frozen zoo for 25 years. And this animal represent, had, a gene, had genetic representation that was gone from the XC2 population. But the, by cloning this animal, the opportunity to introduce this genetic variation back into the XC2 population was manifested. As I mentioned, the possibility to produce and do induce pluripotent stem cells for endangered species has been identified. The first paper uh, on this came out, um, I think, in, in, in 2013 in a collaboration we did with uh, the Scripps Research Institute. And uh, uh, we chose two endangered species. One was a primate, uh, the drill, the largest and one of the most endangered old world monkeys, and the other was a rhinoceros species. And before we get too far into the application of this technology, I would want to be sure that we all understand and, and the context from which I'm speaking is that the, the real way to preserve species is to save them in functional ecosystems and in functional habitats. And efforts need to be um, increased and sustained across the globe to do this. But the very fact that we have so many endangered species and that number is so rapidly increasing suggests that this strategy alone is going to be insufficient for passing on the legacy of biodiversity that current generations have and that other options ought to be looked into and that that can make a crucial difference for what um, uh, generations of humankind in the future have uh, as biodiversity um, uh, in their world. Just quickly, San Diego Zoo also has a plant conservation division and our cryobanking and uh, 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 effort includes um, plant conservation. Most of our plant conservation work is done with a seed bank, but we have many endangered species of plants in San Diego County. And uh, so our focus right now is, is local um, on, uh, on species, some of which are very difficult to preserve as seeds, like oaks, which produce uh, acorns. So we're exploring cryogenic methods of preserving germplasm of a number of endangered species. So we think that a really global approach is needed to bank all kinds of living material and as Dr. Yadav said, we, this really needs to be looked at through the development of regional and, and national based um, uh, efforts to, uh, to cryobank.
just quickly, um, the, uh, these are all species that we have participated in banking cells from the last living individual. The process of extinction is not abstract for us. It is for many people, I think. An animal disappeared and they don't know, but we have had living tissue material. We have processed it. We have helped others to bank the last individual of a species. And it's for, for, uh, for two of them here, it's successful. For the gastropod, for the snail, and for the frog, we're able to bank living material, but we don't know how to grow the cells yet. We know how to preserve cells cryogenically, but we don't know how to actually propagate the cells of some of these species. So this leads us to a sense of, and saving one individual isn't gonna save a species. The need to intervene comes earlier. These are species that we're working on now that are literally on the brink of extinction and uh, that we need, to, that we are trying to expand our efforts to bank cells for these species um, because we're confident that they'll be useful in the future. So I want to just try to impress that this methods of cryobanking living cells can really make this time be one that we are, that adds to successes in reducing losses of biodiversity. And we need hopeful stories like this. And for some species, this may be the only way to save them. And the ultimate success of an effort like this really depends on how much has been banked and nobody's going to be, and we're in a position to do that now. And the need for expanding this capacity is an urgent concern for our time. Quickly, the frozen zoo of its, all of its accessions, uh, Andrew Mooney, a, uh, uh, a, a PhD candidate and Fulbright uh, uh, fellow, uh, examined the collections of the frozen zoo and here the numbers uh, show for the number of, of species that we have in the, these various categories. And you can see that there, uh, we have a substantial number of species in the, what I would just now call the threatened categories. We actually have 5% of all threatened birds, amphibians, and reptiles, at least some individuals represented in the frozen zoo, which is an enormous accomplishment but it means that 20 times more are not represented. And we don't know they may be represented someplace else in the world. We may, we may not have access to them. We have 50% of all of the extinct in the wild species. But if we were to, just looking at the inventory of zoos that is kept in ZIMS, the Zoological Information Management System of Species 360, if all of those zoos, which are gonna have those, which have those animals, which can access them, even after they've died, um, we could triple the number of taxa that are cryopreserved. So this is an important, uh, so zoos play a very important role. And this has been recognized through WAZA, the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums, um, at a recent uh, meeting of WAZA in Bangkok, to pass a resolution to recognize the importance of this activity and to encourage uh, WAZA members to participate in an accelerated plan to bank uh, uh, viable tissue culture cells and to create a global database so that we know who has what, so we know what the priorities are so we can help develop a, a, a plan for identifying priorities. Just very quickly, I need to close, but I wanna just give one example 
that uh, is a very ambitious one, that is to try to uh, use these technologies to preserve a species that's on the brink of extinction, the northern white rhinoceros. And I said species, and I really meant to say unique form of rhinoceros. The northern white rhino um, is only two living individuals now, both females. But we have banked cells in the frozen zoo over the last 40 years and have the cells of 12 individuals. And if we've, and we've sequenced the genomes of these. The southern white rhinoceros, its closest relative, went through a genetic bottleneck a century ago, down to a low of between 30 to 100 animals. So we sequenced a similar number of southern white rhinos and northern white rhinos. And in 12 cells, so the cells of 12 individuals in the frozen zoo, there's more genetic diversity than there is in the entire living population of southern white rhinos that are approximately 16,000 individuals. And we can see the signs of the inbreeding that took place after the genetic bottleneck in the southern white rhino because there are larger stretches of a genetic identity that come about when uh, individuals have, uh, are, have relative the same individual on both sides of their pedigree from their maternal and paternal sides when they're inbred, in other words. So we can detect these things now and actually study genetic load. And we've made fibroblasts from, we've made fibroblasts from those, from those uh, 12 uh, individuals. We've made induced pluripotent stem cells from nine of them. And we're able to direct the development of those. These are beating cardiomyocytes, beating heart tissue, spontaneously beating in the laboratory to show that these cells are indeed pluripotent. We hope to be able to make gametes. Um, and that's a, that's a sort of an extended story. I'd like to acknowledge all of the people in the lab that have uh, contributed to this, or at least the current lab members, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, sir, for an excellent presentation. Uh, I'm sure uh, there was a lot of uh, things which have uh, been an eye-opener for us, new things for us, and also give us hope. I must admit that while researching for your talk, I fondly read your blog about Nola and Angalifu, the northern white rhinoceros at San Diego Zoo, and how they continue to be a beacon of hope. Uh, so we request you to kindly stay on, and if time permits, we will uh, request you to respond to a few questions. Uh, so now I would like to uh, request uh, Dr. Karthike and Vasudevan, Senior Principal Scientist at the Laboratory for the Conservation of Endangered Species, LACONS at Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology, Hyderabad. He has also been appointed the recent expert member for the Central Zoo Authority. He and his team at the National Wildlife Genetic Resource Bank of Lacan's CCMB have developed a repository for germplasm and genetic resources of wild animals since its formative years and have developed techniques to cryopreserve for around 23 species. His present work is to use biological research and mobilizing technologies that will strengthen conservation of endangered species in this country. Over to you, sir. Dr. Karthik, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. So I was just saying that uh, uh, Oliver's talk was really fantastic, and we could, uh, uh, I could uh, make my it. It has eased out my job because uh, it has given a fantastic overview of uh, uh, what are the possibilities and uh, the the rigor with which uh, the San Diego Zoo is uh, developing the biobank and how useful it has been for several species and also understanding of biology. So um, my effort here is to uh, bring forth uh, to the audience of this webinar of the effort that CCMB has been taking up to create a repository for uh, endangered species in India. And obviously the source uh, of all the samples would be from uh, 
majority of them would be from the zoos and um, the whole concept of uh, the laboratory for the conservation of endangered species since its inception uh, one of the most important uh, aspects has been to develop this biobank and uh, since uh, uh, 2007 when we had this uh, uh, institution uh, the physical uh, you know infrastructure being put we have grown in the collection over the years and i'm going to take through the uh, you know the journey of uh, the collection growing in this lab so um, so we all know uh, that uh, uh, the assisted reproduction technologies are uh, very important for rescuing endangered species and uh, um, Dr. Oliver has already given us uh, an overview of the possibilities that present uh, when we do uh, biobanking. And uh, usually when a species come to, comes to the point where it has to be rescued, uh, it uh, it is in a very small population. We call it a founder population. And if the founder population is highly inbred or it is not representative of a diverse uh, genetic uh, constitution of the original population, then very quickly the number of individuals can reduce or infertility can set in and the species can go extinct. So the reproductive technologies have been very well uh, streamlined for domestic species we know we use them for increased production of uh, uh, dairy products poultry products and all of these technologies can very uh, suitably adapted to address requirements of endangered species um, and i've just listed a few of them and uh, uh, there are more and uh, uh, the reason I list them is because in all these aspects, uh, Lacons has been contributing uh, uh, to be able to you know, implement a study production technologies in endangered species conservation. So uh, it starts with reproductive monitoring. You can use uh, uh, hormone assays, fecal uh, hormones, or residues of hormones in sweat or saliva. Uh, they can inform about the reproductive condition of the animals so that interventions can be taken up. Artificial insemination is a well-established technique. And uh, however, it requires a lot of uh, standardization, which I will just uh, mention when I, in my next few slides. And then how reproduction can be controlled, how can we induce uh, e-stress, cause uh, superovulation, and uh, uh, be able to harvest uh, two sides from the female. Uh, all those uh, techniques involve repeated uh, experimentation and standardization. And then finally, we can uh, we have the capability to produce embryos in vitro, uh, preserve them, and use them uh, in surrogate uh, females so that we can give birth to animals of our uh, endangered species, which are uh, required. Then, uh, as, Alec, uh, as Oliver Ryder pointed out, they are important genetic resource banks and they generate a huge amount of uh, information for uh, people who would like to explore the diversity of life and understand evolution and even uh, identify very important species phylogenetically. So, I'm going to uh, uh, rely upon the work that has been done by two of my colleagues uh, to take you through this talk. Uh, one is uh, Dr. Samba Shivarao. He's uh, a female reproduction biologist, uh, basically looks at the female side of reproduction. And uh, Sadanand uh, Sonteke has been, uh, um, both are veterinarians and they have uh, trained to handle animals. And uh, Sadanand has uh, expertise in euthanasia and uh, uh, sorry, anesthesia and uh, uh, male reproduction. And uh, the, the whole problem of uh, uh, working with uh, endangered species is that we have to repurpose many of these te technologies to address uh, all the wild animals. And each of them have distinct uh, reproductive anatomies and uh, 
their their requirements for uh, you know restraint are different and collection of these uh, biological materials is very tough and uh, for all of this uh, the cooperation with the zoos are very vital and this is exactly what uh, i wish to highlight in this uh, talk and um, uh, these are images of the uh, ovaries of different uh, um, animals and uh, you know even uh, people who repeatedly perform um, post mortems will will find it difficult to identify these small uh, you know structures in the body and it requires a well trained eye to pick up these things and be able to harvest them and bring them into the biobank so the main aspect of uh, uh, biobanking is how we can uh, bring uh, endangered species genetic material into the biobank and uh, you have uh, Uh, you know mortality is happening periodically in the zoos and when these animals die if we can bring these animals to conditions where their tissues do not degrade uh, very fast we can harvest uh, testes ovaries from these animals and cryopreserve them and be able to uh, use them for future uh, aster reproduction technologies so there are several examples of this that have happened in the uh, in our lab and uh, uh, we have a variety of tissues that we collect from uh, both post mortem and live animals and uh, this is just a, a list of those uh, samples that we collect and uh, um, uh, this uh, bank is slowly growing and uh, way back in 2007 uh, we have been listed as one of the centers that store Uh, genetic resources on wild animals and uh, we had the talk uh, from oliver mentioned about the frozen zoo in san diego and uh, uh, this uh, uh, the 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 frozen zoo is this is the motivation behind having the biobank in uh, black hawks and we had uh, sambashiva rao is here he went to uh, san diego zoo Uh, to get uh, get trained in 2016 he attended a workshop there and uh, he is now managing this facility which is called the national wildlife genetic resource bank which was uh, dedicated to the nation in 2018 so we have uh, uh, facilities which we would uh, like to um, almost mirror what uh, the frozen zoo in san diego do does and be able to grow like the way they did um, after we uh, Uh, you know obtain the required cooperation from all the zoos in the country so um, the steps that are involved in biobanking uh, genetic resources particularly for the females is that uh, we have to find the ovaries in the females and be able to uh, bring them to lab and uh, then identify recover the oocytes and then mature them cryo preserve them and then finally we can use them for uh, uh fertilization using ivf for xc so all of these requires timely access to the samples so we have been able to uh, perform biobanking of oocytes of several herbivores this is just an example of the variety of herbivores that are being cryo uh, preserved in our repository uh, and uh, uh, you can see that there is a drop off uh, from the number of oocytes recovered to the culture grade oocytes and then mature oocytes this is uh, an artifact of the uh, whole work because uh, every time there is a loss of some uh, viable cells and then you and the whole effort is to maximize the uh, the potential of all the cells that we collect uh, from the dead animal so we are trying to make it better for uh, several species and uh, for all of those who don't know uh, the process of cryo preservation for each of these uh, species the, pro- the the effort has to be standardized independently and they can vary from one species to another so it is uh, involves some tedious experimentation so the same has been done with several uh, pellets uh, uh, you have uh, 
um, tiger, lion, leopard, all of them we have collected oocytes and been able to try to preserve them. And then other uh, mammals are also there in the collection based on you know the uh, access to the samples we have been able to collect these species. However, if uh, we expand our collection, uh, we might be able to cover more species and uh, which, are, uh, which are certainly important to be covered in the biobank. So uh, with the male uh, uh, gamete, uh, uh, we require sperms. Uh, the, the testicular tissue itself is uh, an important source. So when, when we have uh, post-mortem collection of these uh, organs, we look for uh, you know, harvestable cells and be able to preserve the semen uh, from the corda or be able to, if we have live animal, electro ejaculate it and collect the semen and try to preserve it. So all of these has uh, resulted in uh, identification of potent males because zoos are interested in identifying males. Like uh, in the graph on the left, you can see the black buck, which have a uh, large number of sperms in the ejaculate are certainly candidate males to be used for reproduction. So the studies on uh, the male reproductive system has led to uh, improved breeding success in uh, the uh, zoo conditions. And um, uh, you can assess more mortality, mortality and then be able to cryopreserve them and use them in subsequent uh, artificial insemination efforts. So we have had success with the artificial insemination in ungulates, uh, in the case of black buck, uh, we have been able to produce live offsprings twice, and uh, we have uh, uh, had uh, several insemination attempts. And this, at least for ungulates, we can say that the, the methods have been fairly standardized. So another repository uh, of skin tissues, fibroblasts, uh, skin uh, uh, tissue culture that we maintain uh, what uh, Oliver mentioned uh, is also being done here. And uh, we have uh, several species of ungulates, pellets, canids, primates, and reptiles. Or these numbers don't match with what uh, the San Diego Zoo has uh, already done. But uh, we hope to grow in this area because uh, every time when we get a, a, a viable tissue, then we start work on them and uh, try to maintain cell lines of those uh, tissue sources. So uh, I'll just give you an example here, uh, just because we could collect uh, several viable tissues from um, uh, from uh, big cats, uh, particularly tiger, uh, we are in a position to also help uh, today with the uh, identification of tigers, which are seized uh, um, in the forensic cases. So uh, we are standardizing the markers and maybe in future, these uh, cultures will help us produce uh, um, a DNA ladder of all the microsatellite markers so that they can it can be used as standard uh, throughout the country to be able to identify individual tigers which are seized in uh, for forensics, forensic examination. So, um, the spin-offs of such repository are uh, completely unprecedented. We cannot even imagine what the use or application might come to be uh, of value in future. So uh, we have to do this exercise repeatedly and carefully to be able to increase the uh, collections in our uh, biobank. So this is just a representation, not uh, updated to the current year. But uh, a large number of animals uh, are, in, are zoos in India. So uh, obviously animals die and uh, they, when they die, uh, there is a post-mortem and a report is made and then new animals are sought to improve the collection. So it is just uh, a process of bookkeeping which is uh, maintained by the zoos. Uh, but till the time uh, after, the, after the death of the animal, uh, there is no use uh, there is no, the, the reproductive potential of the genetic resource of that animal is not available for future. 
So the idea is to uh, be able to perform in a better way with the, these resources and achieve uh, fantastic uh, outcomes like what has been done with uh, the black-footed ferrets or uh, uh, you know the northern white rhino or uh, the cheetah, uh, which has been recently um, produced, live birds have been produced using in vitro fertilization of uh, sperms, uh, uh, sperms that were stored in frozen condition. So all of these uh, big uh, outcomes uh, may not come about if we do not do the biobanking like the way the San Diego Zoo has been able to do. So the, the proposal is that we create a consortium of Indian zoos to begin with. Uh, zoos can join in future, uh, but initially it will start with a, a group of zoos that have a large collection and be able to um, communicate with them in a, in, a, in a coordinated way to be able to access their samples as soon as, the, uh, as soon as there is a death reported. And these samples are brought to the uh, biobanking facility. And uh, uh, there is also a communication, a two-way communication between the biobank and the zoos and be able to create capacity within the zoos to identify the organs of uh, importance and uh, collect them, preserve them in proper manner so that they are viable for the biobank. And uh, as I told you, the, the, the interaction has to be two-way and uh, the biobank has to facilitate zoos um, and tell them that the animals that have died are, are in fact with a, live in some form in the biobank. And that can also be a form of communication to the visitors of the zoo to inform how science is helping in the zoo management and uh, you know, uh, conservation of endangered species. So I would uh, uh, leave this uh, uh, with a, uh, you know, a quote from uh, Kurt Bernishka, who is the founder of the Frozen Zoo. I think Oliver mentioned about him. And uh, because of his uh, you know, ideals, we have the San Diego Zoo presently functioning the way it is. So he said, uh, you must collect things for reasons you don't yet understand. And I think that's a very uh, strong uh, statement because uh, we don't really know what would be the utility of these things. So uh, we have to do it because in future, they might come of the important use. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, that was excellent and uh, uh, fantastic in terms of uh, the kind of advances we have in our country. And also we heard Dr. Ryder for the global context and we are doing wonderfully on time. So I think I will pick up uh, three questions for each of our speakers and I'll request Dr. Ryder and Dr. Yadav if they can be available. Uh, Dr. Ryder, sir, uh, there has been a very interesting question uh, in the chat box of the YouTube and I'm going to ask you that. Is that what basic facility should a zoo need to contribute to the frozen zoo initiative or to the cryopreservation facilities? Thank you very much. And uh, let's begin by uh, commending um, Dr. Tharkati, Dr. Kart, Karthikian Vasudevan. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce it right, but that was a very good talk. And I'm really pleased to learn about um, the activities that are taking place in India and commend the organizers of this uh, webinar series for really helping um, uh, facilitate uh, international, exchange, international exchange of information, especially in this, in this time. But to answer the question, um, having access to animals is the key feature. Collecting a skin biopsy is not difficult. Um, it can be done by uh, 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 people with, with, uh, with very basic kinds of training. Um, and so I think the requirements to participate are minimal. Um, for, for an institution that doesn't have a research laboratory that's going to process the sample, they need to coordinate closely with the uh, entity, the research lab to which they're going to send the sample so that the right 
media can be used, the right procedures can be in place. But um, uh, there are now, you know, uh, uh, if they're not available already, they will be soon. Things like YouTube videos that explain how to do this. So for for people in zoos or field researchers. So the important thing is to recognize that individuals that have access to an animal can provide a un can can play a very important role, and um, it's not it, it's not as di it's not that difficult. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, the next question I would like to uh, give to Dr. Karthikeyan uh, Vasudevan. Uh, sir, what stage is the project Asian cheetah and is cloning being actively considered for its revival in India? So, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so, yeah, this has been repeatedly asked. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, Lacan's had it uh, as one of its main uh, objectives when it uh, started way back in 2001. Um, but, uh, you, I mean, if you recollect the sequence of uh, events that happened, we had an agreement with the, sh with the government of Iran and they had to spare a few cheetahs from Iran to be able to, that is the, that was identified as the closest, uh, um, you know, cheetah that, uh, that would have occurred in India. So, uh, but, uh, the treaty failed and we didn't get the cheetahs from Iran. So uh, we had leopards, and we we worked uh, extensively on uh, you know intrauterine insemination in big cats, and uh, uh, we tried uh, several artificial insemination techniques with big cats. And people who know the reproductive biology of big cats will will understand how difficult it is to uh, perform any uh, astral reproduction technology with big cats. So uh, so. It, to give a, a very uh, simple answer, the project uh, has presently been abandoned because we don't have the genetic material for the cheetah, um, Indian cheetah, as well as the closest relative of the Indian cheetah. Right, right sir. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, I would like to now re uh, ask a question to Dr. S.P. Yadav. Uh, so the question has come that India has done relatively well in in situ conservation. So is there a need to invest, uh, if if it is in terms of funds, uh, into the in situ technological options such as the biobanking and cryopreservation? Okay, uh, that's true. That India has done excellent in in situ wildlife conservation. Like we are the largest tiger in country in the world. We have 70, more than 75% wild tigers in our country. We are largest single horned rhinoceros country in the world. We have largest Asiatic elephant population in the world. We are the uh, only home to the Asiatic, gear, uh, Asiatic lion in our country. So success is there. But as you have, uh, might, uh, you have heard uh, and uh, seen both the presentation of Dr. Leiter and Dr. Vasudevan, Extinction is not abstraction. Extinction is happening every day, and it's a worry world over. We have seen example of northern white rhinoceros. We have heard example of Indian cheetah. So I think the only way, and, and there is uh, in Chhattisgarh, the state animal wild buffalo, uh, there is uh, no female available other than the one cloned one. So this kind of things are happening every day. We have to be ready for the future. I think this all makes the investment in cryopreservation or biobanking very justifiable. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I think uh, we will close here because uh, we are uh, actually running short of time now. And I would like to end this webinar with a big thank you to all our esteemed speakers. Sirs, we would like to continue this collaboration and we rest assured to everybody that the Indian zoos and specifically Central Zoo Authority will uh, over this uh, first capacity building and strengthening that we did today and into some fruitful collaboration. I thank uh, both the teams at 
team Mysuru and Central Zoo Authority for helping out in the smooth functioning of this webinar. And it is the recording would be available and we will also uh, share the speaker presentations with everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ryder. Hope to see you soon. Maybe because this time this uh, WAZA conference is not happening. Otherwise, we would have uh, physically met you at San Diego. But uh, let us see what happens next to next year. I'm sorry uh, that we won't have the opportunity to meet in San Diego, but <laughs> let's hope for the best. Yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vasudevan. See Thank you, you sometime. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Great talk. Thank you. Great talk from your side as well. <laughs> Thank you. I'll tell Sambha Shiva that I met you. <laughs> That's very good. I'm so pleased you showed that picture of the frozen zoo. So <laughs>